Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is Dominions 4, Thrones of Ascension, Byzantine Pythium. And do I have a treat for you today. With us, co-commentating, is Burn Saber, the creator of this mod. Burn Saber? Hello? Burn Saber, as many of you know, not only creates this mod, but is a prolific mod creator. He's also designed the Worthy Heroes mod, which pretty much everyone who I know that plays Dominions uses, along with some Warhammer Fantasy Battles mods for the Dwarves and Bretonia. Burn Saber is also, from what he tells me, working on an update to this Byzantine Pythium mod with some more historically accurate units for the period. So. Burnsaber has agreed to go through this one turn with me, and also I'm going to ask him some questions about Dominions and modding in general, so I hope you all will really enjoy that. Burnsaber, how are how are things where you are right now? Uh, fine. A bit wet, but uh, I think I'll manage. Yeah, this is a, a cross-continental communication here, ladies and gentlemen, so it's a first for me, so we'll see how it goes. As you can see from the turn itself, we are doing some site searching, although we don't find anything. I think Colonial was able to find one water site with Voice of Apsu. And I'm just going to quickly go through the battles. I'd rather spend more time talking with Burn Saber, and not much exciting happened. We basically just have a bunch of angels running around stealing provinces like we're used to. This looks like a fun battle. It's in Black Peaks. Scalaria is attacking us. So uh, Burn Saber is also playing the game with us, so he'll be able to view the battle and comment on it as well. This is the battle in Black Peaks, Burn Saber. Yeah, uh, it's in some, some ghouls and uh, Velites, some long dead. Yeah, it's nothing nothing special. <laughs> oh, against you. <laughs> yeah, I just crawled down on your end and uh, yeah, they're, they're, that's nothing. Well, let's see, let's see, let's see. Where are you, is the question. This is this is your army. Let's and, there, for and, the... and there you are, you've got the the staff and the Varangian. There you are. So you've survived the whole game up to this point. You have three stars of experience, so congratulations. Yeah. I was kind of accept, accepting to uh, die a bit sooner, but uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes dice roll your way. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think at one point uh, mm, the Astor God almost almost killed me. Uh, like she flew right in front of me, but but the dice rolled my way and she didn't hit me. It seemed. It seemed. <laughs> you know, one thing I noticed from playing this, and you you might want to fix it. I mean, it's up to you, but. The, the seventh, you know, it was supposed to be this kind of amazing spell. You have to go through so much trouble to cast it. But then I noticed that he became enraged and started attacking my own troops. So you may want to increase the magic resistance on him so that that kind of stuff doesn't happen. Because you're, you're figuring this is this amazing unit that slew all the demon lords. He should be immune to a, a little bit of enragement. Yeah, uh, <coughs> he has the maximum amount, like the magic resistance 18. Oh really? Uh, yeah, uh, that's 18 base, so that was a really, really rocky, lucky roll on a magic resistance for that uh, one caster casting that enrage. Uh, it it kind of happens. This is Dominus Four. Yeah, I know. But, uh, Stuff does happen, and in that battle, we lost eight, or we killed 80 units, but we gained a ghoul. Oh, that's going to be fun. We gained a Principe, a Triarius, five Praetorian guards, and we lost one Varangian and nine Velites. There was one battle, too, that I really want to show where we, I think it's Darkwoods, where people were a little nervous. They were saying, you shouldn't send one angel by himself against these ghouls. So I decided not to. I decided to give my friend Crazy Man a little bit of responsibility, and I have him here leading a force, an elite force of troops, along with, I believe this is uh, Hyrokel the Harbinger to see to say, take the ghouls together and so that seems like a fun battle this does seem like an awful lot of ghouls yeah it seems so you usually don't send uh, uh, like if you want to conquer a province you usually send uh, like a small army with thugs uh, because it, uh, it just means that when the army gets killed the thug flees because of the 75% hobby out route 
uh, that uh, probably wouldn't have a if he like just uh, smash this all these guys alone. But it depends on the situation. Excuse me, situation. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, looking at it now, obviously, it would have been smarter had I brought along a priest because my vestals are are very they're good troops, but they're not blessed in this battle when normally they are. Uh, I, I have. I've already read through these turns, so I know that we win this battle, and I just, just for the sake of, how, I, what am I looking for? Fan engagement, I'm, I'm sending Crazy Man on this, because Crazy Man's been sitting in that castle for the whole game, and I just want to give him something to do. But, yeah. you know, I, I, I do that yeah, sometimes. Uh, I kind of like it that you don't always pay up to <clears throat> optimally, but, uh, like, uh, do this, like, a cool little thematic things with the commanders. I try to I try to give people if people are watching these videos you know they, they have characters in these videos so they're invested and so I, I try to involve people and, and do some things that maybe aren't always necessarily optimal but are fun and then people could watch it and go you know I really enjoy doing that so as you can see just a lot a lot of battles of my angels killing everybody purgatory attack 134 by the way that spell perfect I hadn't even planned for it when I started this campaign but it is the perfect spell for fighting Scalaria and Ermor it's just it's just every turn it kills a bunch of undead and it's I'm loving it yeah it's good for your situation right now all right burn saber well I'm done looking at the messages and I want you to kind of look at as you had a little bit of time to do what I was what I'm planning for the next turn and I want to know your opinion specifically the one thing I did not do is the army that we just watched, the one with Crazy Man and Hyrokel, I wanted I was wondering what we should do with them. It looks like we have a pretty clear shot south to Ermor lands and they don't have many troops guarding them, but it may be more strategic for me to move east and and aid the capture of Scalaria by taking the castle with the throne. So what do you think? What in this situation what would you do? Mm, it kinda depends on which opponent is the biggest threat right now. Uh uh, so you're going against the Ermor's thrones, I see. Uh, that's good, but also uh, the Ermor's lands. Uh, these probably have been under his dominion, so there probably be uh, all the people are dead, so they're not gonna give you any gold. Uh, uh, Ermor doesn't have a lot of mages, so they're probably your sideshows really very really, very really well, uh, probably with the AI especially. So they probably won't give you much. So. If you don't need to take them to get a drone, thrown, I'd probably rather strike against uh, Scalaria so that you can gain something from this war. Yeah, I agree with uh, you. We're in kind of a situation up here in Dragon Ridge. That's right in the middle of the map by the pass mm -hmm. um, because this army with led by Eurus has been doing just fine, you know, but now it's going into Siege and Ermor Castle with a temple, and I don't know if there's going to be enough supplies there for them all to survive. I hope there is. There's, um, there has, I haven't had a problem just yet, but this is a wasteland province. It's Halbathria, province 95. It's right between the Ulm capital and the Ulm throne. And yeah, I, I probably will have, that army doesn't have any kind of supply items as far as I could tell, though it does have a couple nature mages, three three lizards mm. anyway. Oh, and Glaucon, who's a, or Glaucon, sorry, who is a, who's a gnome. And then as you see to the south, I'm moving my Angel of Fury around. Fallrush actually got an affliction somehow. Someone was able to hit him. He has a never healing wound, but he's still hanging That's in there. That's not a big of a deal. Yeah. So, anything, is there anything that you see just off the top of your head that, that you would change or that you, that you have an opinion on? Mm, I'm taking a quick, quick look here. Of course. Um... Mm. I see that you're moving the Angel from Pirena, the province 20, your most northern province right now. Uh, the Thatanos, uh, Thanatos, yep. uh, is the leader. You're moving him back uh, against the promised land. But uh, I see that you have uh, a quite a big army in Ivermark. Uh, and Ivermark is not going uh, to get under attack right now. So, like, you, sh you should be able, like, grab, uh, like, take. Uh, some units and just reconquer it with uh, them because you don't, don't need the defense right now they might just as well uh, gain use of province and you can use the Thanatos for something else 
and uh, you're not really losing any uh, defensive uh, because at the next turn if you some threat comes up you can just move them back and because the defensive movement takes priority uh, they will be there before the threat, before the attack comes those krakens uh, can't uh, breathe air so they're stuck there I see what you're saying. All right, well, I'm going to do that then. I'll I'll move General Wallace out along with Tokshin. Tokshin is going to going to be blessing everyone since he's... Well, no, you know what? I'm not going to... Because Tokshin's all set up with spells. I'm just going to have my garrison support guys. I'm going to clear their orders and just have them bless since they can, the lizards. Oh, I guess they can't. No, they're not priests. Oh, whoops. Yeah, there's a there there's a sacred. So I guess it is going to be Tokshin. So Tokshin is going to go with. Oh, jeez, he can't he can't divine bless on his own. All right, well you know what? I'm just going to leave everything. I'm going to have Wallace just go. The vessels will be fine even without blessing. There's enough of them. Yeah, so, it's okay. only just going to be BD and perhaps a Capricorn casting swarm. I think you'll be fine. So that means Thanatos. I'm going to move him to the west and lay siege to Osmark just to keep. Ashdod busy. Think that's a good idea? Uh, Ostmark. It's just right to the west of where he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of army there. But nothing really dangerous, it seems. Uh, Winemen can ignore all their moral 50, I think, mindless. But uh, you have enough protection so that they should, be, they should be able to strike you back. Earlier in the game, I would look at this and be like, ooh, I can't do this, but after I've seen what these angels are capable of, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're amazing. They're, they're, they're a lot stronger than they look. You see them and you see 40 hit points and you think they're not that strong, but they really are. Yeah, it's also left that the AI is a uh, bit dumb in con countering them. Like, uh, against a human player, you would have lost many, many, many of them. But uh, what I'm seeing here is their god is back and she's in that province. So maybe maybe I don't want to. Yeah, the gods. Uh, it depends uh, if he if she follows the same commands as earlier in the in the LB where she just attacks. That's all right. But if she's casting spells, uh, she might have something up her sleeve. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move him two provinces to the west to Sadika, where he can destroy the temple, take the province, and then I have. Puggles, or Barabel, I'm sorry, moving up to Elador, which is right south of it. So I'll have two angels right next to each other, and then they both will attack that province together. And by that time, my, my army will have moved back into Ivermark. So that should be pretty solid. Yeah, sounds, sounds okay. And I'm moving out my cataphracts, because otherwise I, you're never going to see them in battle. <laughs> because this, this game is winding down, and, and they're just sitting there, mm -hmm. so... I know you want yeah. me to recruit mm -hmm. some pyrotes. Uh, I've just been so afraid, you know, because they're they're kind of situational. Sometimes they can... I'll recruit four of them right now. Sometimes they can hurt your own people. So I've been like, I've never really been in a situation where I feel like, oh, you know what, it's okay if I kill a bunch of my own... bunch of my own guys. Uh, yeah. Do you but, uh, but, uh, but, like... <laughs> if you go first. Okay, do you want to talk a little bit about the purpose of designing that unit and how you think they should be used? Uh, like whenever I design a mod nation, I always want uh, like there to be some kind of gimmick, like something that you can't get uh, from uh, from regular dominions. And I like uh, I kind of like I like the mechanical idea of pyroads. Uh, they're like a really strong unit, uh, but uh, <clears throat> they can also strike themselves, uh, go cause a bit of friendly fire, so you have to be pretty careful when using them, like kind of a high high risk, high reward uh, strategy. Now, is their attack similar to like the fire drake, you know, where it just shoots that big blast of fire in front of them and hits everything? Is it, I haven't actually seen them in battle. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm recruiting some, maybe we'll see some, but just in case we don't, is that the mechanic of, of their fire attack? Not quite. Uh, the fire drake shoots like a beam. It always goes in front of them. Uh, but uh, pirates have a very dark, they have hit two squares. Uh, the first square is always the one they hit with the weapon to, to in front of them. But the second square where they're, they're 
fire attack hits will be random around uh, that area. Uh, so <coughs> it can hit like uh, two squares of enemy troops, or it might hit uh, one the one enemy enemy square and one of your squares too. But like uh, especially in the early game, they are pretty well because they can, if you get lucky, they can kill like uh, two squares of knights or heavy cavalry or something else really tough uh, with a, like a swing single swing. So the the fire attack is really powerful in terms of the damage that it does. Uh, yeah, it's like a firebrand, uh, comparable to a firebrand, but uh, in it's like two squares. Uh, in our, on a recruitable unit, uh, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, especially At least if, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, if you have like ten of them, <laughs> I could see how that could do a lot of damage. Yeah, but the thing is, you need to kind of sprinkle them around. You can have them like uh, on a single, uh, single squad, uh, because if they hit themselves. Uh, their own square, you will lose three high roads in that case if you have a square field with them. So, uh, at least in my testing, the best way to, to minimize your losses while using them is to like sprinkle them with your regular units so that when they hit their own square, uh, <coughs> you only lose one high road, not three. Understood. Okay, so Burn Saber, uh, I did have some questions for you, and I think we've we've discussed the game enough. So let's let's talk just about in general in, uh, your your situation, why you chose this this mod, and what's going on. So in the in the background, I'm going to just pick a random battle that looks interesting, and I will ask you some questions. So why did you choose to make mods for Dominions Four? Uh, that's a long story. Actually, my modding career started in Dominion's 3. Uh, this mod uh, that you are playing right now uh, actually was originally Dominion's 3 mod. Uh, I made it first for that one. Uh, but I think I don't actually remember how I got into modding. Uh, it just probably kind of happened. <laughs> because I got. I, I really like the Dominion series. Uh, I remember, like, uh, as when I was a younger, I like uh, had to cut uh, grass for my neighbors to get, collect money enough uh, to get, and then have my mom order Dominion's with his credit card <laughs> because you had to order it. So, and he was, she was really doubtful about like uh, giving this random, uh, like a really indie game store. Uh, her credit card number. <laughs> I, I managed that, and I was really happy about it. That was Shrapnel? I don't think at that point. It was the first Dominions, uh, Priest, Propers, and Pretenders. Oh, wow. And, and like, uh, Dominions 2 didn't run on my current computer, so I missed that, but uh, when I heard that Dominions 3 was out, and it worked on my computer, uh, that was it. <laughs> but what made you take the leap from being a player of the game to being the, a modder, to start contributing to the content? That's tough because I can't remember. I just, oh, okay. uh, I just remember kind of like uh, when I was uh, doing a summer job and I was like uh, making notes for my first mod nation, uh, which was Alugra uh, in Dominion's Three. I haven't, I haven't translated to Dominion's Four yet. Uh, it, it was my first mod. The sprites really suck. <laughs> now that I looked at them, uh, so I'm gonna redo it at some point, like completely. I remember that one. It was the the city of mages, right? Uh, like the city of heroes. It city was, of uh, heroes. Oh, it was like superheroes. Like you had like a bunch of random paths on all of your commanders. Uh, yeah. Uh, you also like uh, had a capital only units that came uh, like a two recruitable units that came with magic paths, and you have to give the freeze on them to get uh, to make the mages. And like you had a uh, recruitable units like with sailing and other commander-only abilities that you could only use once you keep the breeze on them with a cheaper national keep the breeze spell. Wow. That was like the, that nation's game game gimmick. Game, game. Yeah, I, I remember that one. That's hilarious. I, I did not know that you were you were responsible for that. Yeah, that was my first mod. Wow. And after that, it kind of snowballed from there. <laughs> What made you want to do a mod based on Byzantium? Uh, this is actually kind of embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> I'm just now such a voice on the internet. I think I, I can tell everyone. So the thing was, 
that uh, oh, I was a bit of a metalhead. I was in high school uh, around the time when I was modding Dominion's 3, and there was like a, this also metal song about Varangian, Varangian gods. And uh, when I played the uh, Vanilla Dominion's 3 in Pythium, it didn't have Varangian gods, and that that upset me up, upset me for some reason. Uh, so enough upset me enough that I made a mod to add them in, and I started uh, just like uh, reading about uh, other Byzantine stuff and got interested, and I just like a uh, and more than just the varying varying in my mod. So that's uh, other. Hmm? I mean, that's really what got me into it too. Not not heavy metal music, but I played medieval medieval Total War the original. And I saw the, the Cataphracts and the Varangian Guard, and I was just like, these guys are awesome. How come I never heard about them before? Because here in the West, or, well, you're in the West too, but here in America, we don't, we don't learn about Byzantium, at least not in regular school. I guess if you go to certain colleges and take certain courses, you can learn about it. But we learn about the Roman Empire, and then it, it pretty much stops as soon as Rome falls. And so the fact that I just discovered this amazing empire that had these cool unique viking soldiers that i had never heard about before that's really what got what got me into it yeah uh that's who i i'd like heard of Byzantine empire before because i'm uh, like a eastern orthodox christian so we had we was taught uh, a bit about that in school uh, but like the wearing gods and those of course are not <laughs> uh I'm not talking about in those classes, so I was when I heard about them through metal song, I admit uh, I studied a bit more, and they are really really interesting. Uh, I don't think there are like uh, any other examples of like a uh, emperor having mercenaries as uh, foreign mercenaries as like a bodyguards or as an elite unit. Yeah, it's true, and it kind of gives view to the notion that Byzantium was such a political nightmare like there were so many people like conspiring against each other that in order to survive the emperor had to have bodyguards that were in, es in essential foreigners because they were the only ones that he could trust to actually yeah. protect him yeah so what are your future plans I, I know that you are working on redoing this mod to have troops that are a bit more byzantine because right now we basically have troops that are roman republic not even roman empire we're not even at legionnaires yet we're at we're at the hastadis and the triarius but with some byzantine touches like the cataphracts and the varangians so talk a little bit about your the changes you're going to be making to this mod as well as if you have any ideas that you're willing to share of mods that you are considering in the future uh, right, well, I'll, I'll first talk about this mod, uh, so, uh, yeah, now that uh, this LP actually inspired me to read a bit about more uh, about this, so the Byzantine actually has some really uh, cool, like, unique middle units, and, like, uh, I also got, like, a gameplay gimmick, gameplay gimmick idea uh, with this, so, like, uh, I was thinking of making, uh, it almost might be that I'll have to make two nations, one for middle a middle era and one for late era. I don't know right now. Uh, once I get uh, the inspiration, and start working on the sprites and so forth. I'll probably see how many sprites I do, and if there's too many, I'll probably start just split, split them up into two nations. Uh, but like a uh, the oh, idea is that there's a uh, like a divide between mercenary units uh, that cost a bit more gold uh, than the units of their uh, caliber would normally cost but on the other hand they would have a lot of lower resource costs uh, to kind of um, show that they come with their own equipment and also give them a bit of gimmick so when you need troops right now you'd go for the mercenaries uh, and then there'd be national units uh, that have cost a bit less gold or a bit less upkeep. Uh, I, I'm still thinking on that which one of them it is, but they'll cost a little bit more resources. Uh, like I'll probably explain it, uh, explain it as a, like a bureaucracy thing or something. Uh, and uh, also probably like uh, historically, I think the uh, lamiral mail, I think on the uh, horse units uh, was like a. Really time intensive to make. Uh, 
so it's also should uh, be accurate in that sense that the, like uh, the horse units might be a bit more resource intensive. Sure. You know, I just have to say I love that idea. Like, because you, what I enjoy is where there are nations that you can play them different ways. Like uh, an example would be Mictlan, where you could play them with a, a bless, like a triple bless, or what, what a few people have talked about in the forums is you can play scales Mictlan, where you can just you can go with exalt opposite, low magic but really awesome scales. And so the nation you're describing to me, you could play it with three order and, and have ton and growth, let's say, and have tons of money. And, and you could just rely purely on a mercenary force and take maybe a sloth dominion to get some extra points. Or you could go with a high production dominion and maybe a little bit of turmoil or, or maybe not so much growth. And because you'll be able to have, you'll afford your national units, which are high production, uh, sorry, high resources, but aren't high income. Yeah. Uh, I was also thinking about that. I also want to try to design the nations that, like, that have uh, several different roads. Uh, or ways to play them uh, too, because I think that's a uh, pretty cool too. I cannot have a, like a really, really obvious thing to do with the nation, but have like a lots of different roads or a uh, lot of nifty little bits that you can like uh, mess with and try. Like uh, this nation, uh, like uh, in Vanilla Bithium, the Pearl Vestals are. Uh, <coughs> Are capital only. That means you'll never use them, and they're not as strong anyway. So that's why I made them like not cap, not capital only in this mode. So like you could, you can kind of build up a strategy around them, and I kind of add that as an option. You know, let's let's talk about that real quick because when I first started this LP, based on my conversations with you, my intention was to to do that. My intention was to take a pretty good bless, not an amazing bless, but a pretty good bless, and kind of use my Vestals as my frontline force. And as the game has wore on, I haven't really been able to do that, primarily because I can't afford to build castles and temples, which you need to have... The, I mean, what you would really need for that strategy is you'd want like three or four castles with temples really close to each other in your heartland so you can quickly mass Vestals. And I haven't been able to do that. So upon looking at this campaign, in hindsight, I was thinking, you know, I might have been able to do better with less magic and more strong scales. And then focus most on recruiting my, my troops, because one thing that's dogged me throughout this whole campaign is low production or low resources and low income. And so I was thinking about that, and then I was thinking, well, what would I have taken away? And I think that the nature was pretty necessary because it gave extra hit points. That was probably the best bless I had. Fire was necessary looking back on it because of because of purgatory. So I was thinking maybe I could have lowered the astral. The reason I had the astral that high was in order to forge rings of sorcery and rings of wizardry. But frankly, the game's almost over and I haven't even forged one of them. And I'm, I'm really low on astral pearls. So I think if I were to do this again, I would lower the astral magic since it doesn't really do much in terms of a bless and spend that money on scales. What do you think? Uh, yeah, uh, that sounds pretty well because the magic Christians ain't doing uh, much against the AI anyway. So that bless is uh, pretty much worthless uh, in that sense. Uh, also the high astral, like you said, uh, it doesn't it doesn't do much because at least I don't anyway anymore that many for Ring of Wizardry or Sorcery, because they're just too expensive. Uh, I usually try now try to go with other routes to get the uh, uh, magic pass that I need. Uh, especially with this nation, like if you spend the Astral Games on the Unique Angels, uh, they will diversify your magic, so you can get the boosters you need cheaper that, cheaper that way, actually. Yeah, that's really disappointed me how my astral income is is relatively low. I mean, most of the stuff I'm summoning and and forging does not require astral gems, and yet I still never have enough to really for uh, truly summon any more because I wanted to get all six of these guys, but it looks like I may I may not even be able to have one more, maybe one more, and that's it. So I guess on the one hand that's good because those who are watching will be incentivized to go and play this nation on their own so that they can they can summon those units, uh, but but I do feel like. Especially because I bump up my magic sites when I set up games. I bump them up higher than normal people do. I am sad that I don't have enough astral gems to summon all these guys. Well, your magic income is uh, <laughs> a bit insane, actually. 
uh, at least of uh, at least on the game MP games and so forth when, when comparing them. Uh, you could actually just like uh, alchemize uh, the bit of your death games. You can you can't really use all those anyway. All that income, uh, perhaps a bit of earth too. Yeah, no, you're right about that, and that's probably what I'm going to be doing in the next couple of episodes. Is just doing a lot of alchemizing so that I can get out some angels. I I, I feel pretty mm. secure uh, that my army in the south is going to be able to take that throne, and I feel pretty secure that my army uh, with with you, with Emperor Burnsaber, is going to be able to move up north against Scalaria. So, um, we did not get we didn't get to finish with what your plans are, if any, for future mods, not necessarily related to Byzantine Pythium. Uh, I just finished Bretonia. Uh, that was kind of a big deal. So, I think I'm gonna just now, right now, just do small updates, and uh, like uh, I have a bit of a silly idea that I want to do, like. Uh, I have tons of like random ideas that I can't. I want to mod, but I can't really add them to any mod because uh, honestly they're kind of dumb. So I'm just I'm thinking of doing like a uh, just a mod that's kind of dumping ground for all my silly ideas, and it's gonna be uh, silly. Like uh, I'm gonna add a spell uh, to it that blinks all units on the battlefield. Like a blink, you know that. that that spell that randomly teleports your commander. Oh yeah, yeah. I call it the suicide place. spell. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> make one that uh, affects the whole battlefield. Your units, <laughs> enemy units, just chaos. I think that's awesome. I will definitely showcase that mod whenever it comes out. Um, so yeah. Bretonia. Uh, now what? What? What makes Bretonia special? I, I'm not. I mean, I know, I know basically the Warhammer lore, but Bretonia is a nation yeah. I don't know much about. So, do you want to talk a little bit quickly about about that mod and and what you've done with it? Yeah, uh, the gameplay gimmick uh, with Bretonia is kind of like uh, you have a really cheap uh, and really awesome, especially for the cost, like knights, like the tabletop army. Uh, but uh, you kind of pay for it in that like you don't have like a crappy magic, uh, but it's like really centralized. You you have a really awesome uh, capital only mage. But the rest of your mages, especially the one you can recruit outside of the capital, are a bit are is I made it deliberately overcosted and sucky, so like your research is gonna be a bit lackluster. You perhaps won't be able to use as much battle magic as you probably want, but your knights should have to uh, will have to kind of uh, uh, kind of carry you know, work around it. that. Yeah, yeah, and also uh, there are a lot. Uh, more play play game play playing, but I was able to do with the Dome 4 mechanics. Like uh, they have like uh, oppressed peasants, so I put, I made all the peasants like slaves, and like I really the commanders have tax the knight commanders have taskmaster, so they're really only ones who can like uh, uh, lead them. And, really? Like, uh, oh, not the only ones, but uh, they have like the your basic um, uh, crappy peasant has like moral six. If you put uh, more moral six peasants on an indie commander, they're gonna flee like when the first arrow hits. You like need, need your uh, knight commanders with like task max of plus three, plus three, or plus three, or plus, or even plus three to kind of be even be able to lead them as a coherent unit. So the Bretonian nation in the tabletop game is characterized by really powerful and excellent knights, but really terrible infantry. Uh. I don't think that in tabletop it's uh, terrible, it's like just there. Like if you need uh, um, some men to take hits, uh, they'll do that. But uh, like the main, uh, the main state of the nation is the cavalry, or the, like the sacred knights. Cool. And like every, everything in one hammer, uh, the knights are like uh, really over the top and like a really kind of dumb. Like uh, they're like Adrian knights turn up to 11. Uh, which is why I kind of like uh, doing Warhammer mods because the in, <laughs> it's just it's just so silly <laughs> and kind of fun, right? Just you know, kind of go with it. Well, like, if you uh, if you would like to see Burn Saber's Dwarves mod in action, I know that Tokshin, uh, the LPer who I linked to on my about page, has a. LP where he's playing as Altdorf and I and I know the dwarves feature prominently in that one 
And so you can get a look at Burn Saber's work on that nation there. I don't currently know of any LP that covers Bretonia, but I know you can easily download it from the Sura or from the Dom for Mods forum. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's also on this. Uh, I, I think you mentioned that it's on the Sura. Uh, so, but uh, I don't think there's any LP because I released this this week. <laughs> Well, there you go. So. That's that makes sense. We're not, we're not that fast here, in the, here yeah. in the LP community. But all right, Burn Saber, thank you so much for taking the time. Just so you all know, right now it's like midnight uh, where Burn Saber is right now. So he's really he's really uh, inconveniencing himself to be here, and I appreciate it so much. And I really want you to go out and check out his work, specifically. His nation mods are fantastic, but specifically Worthy Heroes, which again, everybody I know uses it. I, I couldn't imagine playing without it. It adds it adds and changes the heroes to all nations and just makes them heroic. Because before, they had cool descriptions, but they tended to die really quickly, and, and you honestly wanted to have them stay in your capital because they were so uh, fragile. And, and this mod, Worthy Heroes, which I use in all my LPs, it just makes them special and makes them more powerful, makes them so you want them on the battlefield. Burn Saber, I sincerely hope to see a lot more cool stuff from you in the future, especially this mod you, you kind of hinted at, this crazy mod where anything goes. That's that's got me very interested, and I just want to thank you so much for being a part of this and taking the time to co-commentate on this episode with me. Uh, yeah, I enjoy it too. So I'm going so. to I'm going to let you let you do the uh, the close. So why don't you say good night to everybody and. Uh, Thank you again. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>